our next Zoom speaker today. Damien Beauchamp is the Chief Development Officer at Eight Rivers Capital. He has worked on UAE and KSA's energy sector since 2016. Currently, he is directing the creation of a zero carbon fuels export strategy, which sounds really cool. And his work has been featured in Forbes, Fortune, Nature Chemistry, and Chemical Engineering News. Yeah, uh, Damien is, uh, is another guy similar to Aaron, uh, where, you know, he's got so much going on. Uh, he's provided or helped provide over a billion dollars in market value around, you know, energy solutions. He's working on, you know, net zero solutions, low carbon energy solutions. And, you know, I actually have a, a unique story. I had a lawyer from um, D.C. and his law firm call and ask me. It's like, hey, is uh, Damien going to be there in person? And I was like, no, he's actually going to be on Zoom this year. He's like, okay, because uh, uh, our, our firm was actually going to come out and speak to him. So I thought that was really, really cool that I just get a random call from D.C. <laughs> uh, asking about Damien. So without um, further ado, we give you Damien. Uh, thank you so much. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to present at this wonderful conference, which I think will uh, on an annual basis, grow into kind of a center of gravity for the West Coast carbon capture arena, as well as other clean energy technologies like nuclear and, and solar and, and others. Um, so uh, Damien Beauchamp here, president with Eight Rivers Capital, and I'm going to be talking to you all about uh, today about a project uh, that we're developing with the Southern Ute Indian tribe called Coyote Clean Power. And this is to deliver clean, reliable, and affordable energy uh, to the Four Corners region uh, in the United States. So, as I mentioned, uh, President at Eight Rivers, also Chief Development Officer at the firm, and Eight Rivers has partnered with the Southern Ute Indian Tribe uh, in developing Coyote Clean Power LLC, and I'll be taking you through what exactly that is in a moment. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Eight Rivers. Uh, Eight Rivers um, is developing carbon capture technologies that will allow our clients to meet their net zero ambitions profitably. And we have a whole host of solutions, uh, different forms of carbon capture for different sectors, power generation, cement capture, steel, hydrogen, um, and various gas processing technologies. So we've got our technology development arm. In addition, we've got a project development arm. So where we see opportunities and clients come to us, uh, we might take an opportunistic approach uh, and become an equity uh, holder in the project and uh, use our resources to help develop it. And typically we're looking for partners who bring something to the table and are fairly strategic in nature and, and the Southern Ute are that. Uh, they have a deep experience in the oil and gas sector. Uh, they have two subsidiaries, in particular, Red Cedar Gathering and Red Willow. Red Willow is a production entity, and uh, Red Cedar Gathering is a uh, transmission distribution, kind of midstream player, if you will. Uh, those are on reservation, and they do do some work off reservation through Aka Energy, another subsidiary of the Southern Ute Indian Tribe Growth Fund. Um, and so we're excited to be working with them. We've got a wonderful site, and I'll tell you a bit about that here in a moment. Further, I'd like to highlight the environmental stewardship uh, of the Southern Ute Indian Tribe. Um, they, uh, for about 10 years, ran a methane capture program uh, on the west of their reservation, which captured uh, fugitive methane coming out of ex exposed coal bed seams uh, that were leaking methane, not due to any anthropogenic intervention, rather purely natural causes. And that program was successful. And I want you to remember that because a little later on in this discussion, you'll see how that experience from the tribe starts to play into how this project can achieve negative emissions power generation, something that I think is unprecedented and really can't be achieved by most renewables in the market today. So what are we doing? We're developing, constructing, and planning to operate a 280 megawatt electric near zero emissions power plant on the Southern Ute Indian Reservation 
near Coyote Gulch. When are we planning to come online? Uh, we're targeting 2025. And we're looking at FID, final investment decision, uh, for the capital to take us all the way through at around 850 million uh, coming in the second half of 2022. We look to utilize the DOE loan program to finance the debt portion of this project. And I will say that, you know, I, I wanna just kind of touch back on the importance of this conference. I am in fact on vacation on the uh, East Coast uh, on the Outer Banks right now. And I found this event uh, so critical and was gathering such a uh, strong kind of uh, following that I thought it was critical that I take time out of my vacation to tell you all about this project as well as be in attendance for the conference. So thank you again. Now, what are the benefits of the project? And I'm trying to keep this fairly simple and we'll get a bit more technical here in a moment. Um, it's energy efficient. So it uses less natural gas compared to traditional natural gas combined cycle with carbon capture. The unit can operate water free. Um, so we can do pure air cooling. Uh, we will discharge some water from the process, uh, but that will be used through an evaporative cooling mechanism uh, so all that produced water will actually go to the atmosphere. And I'll talk more about how it is that our process actually net produces water. Um, we're in a water constrained region. And I've spoken to a lot of the other carbon capture technologies on the market today and asked them to provide solutions. And to date, it is impossible to do carbon capture water free in the way that we're doing it is what I'm hearing from a lot of the majors. Um, so with respect to clean air, the process is really nice. It produces no NOx, no SOx, nor does it have any particulate. So we can position these facilities in non-attainment zones. Further, um, we already know that there's regulations on NOx, SOx, and particulate, um, but we're really climate future-proof with this technology as it captures 97% of all the CO2 that's generated during the power generation cycle. It's flexible, uh, it's able to ramp, uh, within 15 minutes from zero net load to the grid to full load to the grid. Additionally, there's an energy storage component that I'll tell you about today that's a bit different than a battery. Uh, I call it molecular energy storage. Um, and it's a very efficient, low cost way to store mass amounts of energy when utilizing the technology that we'll be employing. And so what is that technology? The technology employed at the Coyote Clean Power Facility will be based on the net power technology, which is based on the alum fet vet cycle. It's a thermodynamic cycle that recirculates CO2 as the working fluid and uses oxycombustion to uh, bring that working fluid up to temperature prior to coming into the turbine. The alum fet vet cycle was invented by two engineers at Eight Rivers, Rodney Allum and Jeremy Fetvet, they're still with us today. And we're excited to see this technology, which was really ideated in 2010, come to commercial capacity uh, through this project, as well as two other projects we're developing, one in Illinois and the other in the UK at Teesside. But uh, focusing back on the technology and the CCP facility, the way net power works in the alum fetvet cycle is oxygen is supplied to a power cycle from an air separation unit. And this air separation unit, although it produces the oxygen, it so happens to also produce argon, nitrogen, and some additional oxygen because the capacity factor of the air separation unit is 98%, where the capacity factor for the power cycle is 92%. And that difference in 6% gives us a bit extra oxygen that we're able to utilize for sale or other local uses. In the case of this project, this oxygen won't be too valuable, but we do see the argon as providing some financial upside to the sale and monetization of the carbon dioxide, as well as the sale of the electricity coming out of the facility. What's really nice is the natural gas that goes into the front end is able to be fully supplied from the Southern Ute tribe and those who produce on reservation, reducing a significant 
first step risk for our project, and that's the fuel source. A traditional power facility will take in methane and will produce electricity. It will also produce CO2, but that CO2 will not be pipeline quality and uh, that, that CO2 won't be able to be monetized. And so in this facility, we're able to do the same thing that a natural gas combined cycle unit would do, and that's take in natural gas, put it through a turbine and, and combustor, produce electricity for sale, while also inherently capturing all of the carbon dioxide and producing valuable byproducts. And you can see some of the example and uses for some of these byproducts today. So the way the cycle works to get a bit more specific is oxygen is coming in from the air separation unit, natural gas is coming in from a pipeline and CO2 is recirculating within the system. Now the width of all these lines are proportional to the mass and that's to kind of give you a sense for what's recirculating in the system and, and how much is coming in. And so this CO2 will come into the front end of the combustor, oxygen and natural gas will be combusted. And you'll see that those combine to create this slipstream of additional CO2 that's gonna join the main body of recycling CO2. It'll also produce some very hot water. Those will pass through a turbine. The hot water will then come through a heat exchanger, ultimately cooling to room temperature and being precipitated as liquid water. The CO2 also passes through the heat exchanger system and then the CO2 goes through a series of compressors and pumps to bring it back up to pressure. The pressure ultimately that it needs to be at to enter the combustor is 300 bar and will achieve around 900 degrees Celsius uh, through this combustor. As it comes out of the turbine, it's going to reach 30 bar and go as low as ambient temperatures. And so that CO2 needs to be brought back up to pressure as well as temperature and so to bring it back up to pressure, we use a series of compressors and pumps. Part of the secret sauce for the alum fefet cycle is the utilization of pumps rather than compressors, as pumps provide a uh, lower parasitic uh, load on the overall system compared to a pure compression system for bringing back up to uh, pressure. And so that liquid water will come out We'll be able to produce that. It can be put into an evaporative pond or evaporative cooling system. Uh, it, can, it can also uh, be processed in, in regions like the Middle East that are significantly arid um, and utilized for uh, agricultural purposes. Um, this CO2 slipstream will come out at 99% purity based on some of the tests that have been run at the Laporte facility. And the CO2 then passes through the heat exchanger system, recovering some of that heat coming uh, out of the effluent of the turbine. And the CO2 is then brought back to the combustor at pressure and then uh, brought back to temperature. Now, as we run that facility, we will net produce 284 megawatts to the electrical grid. As I mentioned before, we have this air separation unit and we have the power cycle. Both of these things have parasitic loads contained within them. And we have taken all of those parasitics into account when telling you that we're providing 284 megawatt electric to the grid. 67 megawatts of electricity are supplied to the air separation unit to produce that oxygen. We're able to take this air separation unit and also take some of this electricity from the electrical grid. So if renewables are high on the, the system, we can simply allow some of that power to run our ASU. We can turn down our power cycle and we can store some of that oxygen that's being produced from say solar and wind uh, and store that in a tank for later consumption. Now, when renewables, the sun stops shining or the wind stops blowing, we're able to take that oxygen from the tank, supplement the oxygen coming from the ASU, and thereby reduce the parasitic load required to run that ASU. What that means is we have 20 megawatts that we can put back to the grid instantaneously as an energy storage mechanism. Now, if you're building 
one of these, an alum FETVED cycle, which includes that ASU, and you decide that energy storage is important and valuable in a region, which it is in the Four Corners region, as they um, retire multiple gigawatts of coal and bring on very intermittent resources like wind and solar, you need a low cost, reliable energy storage mechanism, and it would be a benefit if it was non-toxic as well. And all we need is the oxygen tank. If we wanted to do two days, 48 hours of 20 megawatt energy storage, all we have is a $20 million CapEx adder to enable that functionality. That's 940 megawatt hours of storage capacity and would be the world's largest and cheapest battery uh, in the world today were we able to achieve uh, implementing this mechanism into the cycle, which we believe is fairly trivial compared to the complexity we've already uh, proven out and continue to test down at the Laporte facility. So this is the location. Um, with all carbon capture projects, one of the things that, that you know, seems fairly obvious once it's said, uh, location is key, especially for the first wave, for those first couple handfuls, for the first dozen of projects, location is going to be key. You're going to need major infrastructure in place in order to achieve near-term timelines and be able to uh, reduce the total capital required to implement that project. The more infrastructure that's in place, the greater the return in the project because ultimately you're lowering your upfront CapEx requirements. And this location is really wonderful. We've got a 345 kV WAPA line, 1.7 miles to the west. We could also reach the San Juan or Four Corners substations relatively easily, or we could go north into Colorado and reach the Hesperus substation uh, without much of a problem. Additionally, two miles to the south, we've got the Cortez pipeline, uh, which is a CO2 pipeline, um, which takes CO2 down into the Permian of Texas and delivers that. Further, we've got the local ability for sequestration, which is something that really excites uh, myself as well as the Ute. Um, given their sovereignty from the federal government, uh, one thing I think would be really compelling if tribal nations were given primacy similar to states like Wyoming who have received primacy on class six wells. Um, but more to come on that later, hopefully. Uh, so we've got these key pieces of infrastructure. We've got a wonderful brownfield site that's fully permitted. Typically the longest piece of work that needs to be done when working on tribal lands is the archeological survey and they most always find things and and that extends your timeline. Well, we've removed that risk because our project partner and co-owner in this project also controls and owns the land. Um, and there's already some infrastructure in place that'll be really convenient for this project. For example, this, this site already has the CO2 uh, pipeline, as I mentioned, but it's also got natural gas piped all the way up to it. Further, there's unprocessed gas that's laden with CO2 coming to the facility because it was previously used as a gas processing facility. What this means is that we'll be able to take transmission quality gas on day one uh, at market rates, and we can start to test taking unprocessed CO2 laden natural gas, which shouldn't be a problem for the cycle as we're already pre-mixing our natural gas with some of that recirculating CO2 prior to coming into the combustor. So we can reduce the amount of uh, controlled mixing of CO2 we're doing if we're taking a pre-loaded uh, CO2 natural gas or an acid gas, if you will, into the front end of the, the system. That would lower fuel costs substantially, increasing the uh, IRR in, in really meaningful ways. And we've done some testing on our model to see what that looks like, and it's really wonderful. Further, that CO2 that's bringing unprocessed gas to this facility just happens to bring some of that uh, gas from the outcrop methane capture program to this facility. Uh, currently, the previous uh, program was suspended, but 
there could be others on the horizon and I can't speak to that too much. What else is nice is the Southern Ute have, uh, through Red Cedar Gathering have a 5050 JV or a 5149 JV with Kinder Morgan and Kinder Morgan owns this CO2 pipeline here. And so we think that that relationship should help facilitate the utilization of this pipeline were we to not sequester locally. Further, because Net Power is a consortium between Exelon, which is a large nuclear uh, and electric utility in the United States, McDermott, which is a large EPC globally, and Occidental Petroleum, uh, as well as Eight Rivers, we think we've got some really wonderful project partners uh, that we look to lean on as this project develops and, and provide mutual benefit to those partners. Exelon would be a wonderful operator for this facility as they've already got experience doing so at the Laporte facility in Texas. Occidental, wonderful partner to safely and securely store that CO2 when it reaches the Permian Basin. Uh, and so we look forward to developments on all those fronts moving forward. So this is uh, another picture of the site. Again, beautiful location, wonderful backdrop here with the, with the mountains. Uh, the Ute are currently working to the Southern Ute Indian Tribe Growth Fund and Red Cedar uh, is currently working to clear this site. Uh, and then we will be putting on that site what you see here uh, in this uh, diagram uh, and plot plan. We've got our air cooling fans here. We've got an electrical switch yard that's in place and this line runs to a 115 kV. We've got a natural gas pipeline already coming into the facility. We've got our CO2 pipeline that will utilize right-of-ways already exi in existence for the natural gas pipeline which is also very convenient and extremely helpful and lowers the risk significantly. And we've got a green pipeline bringing in that acid gas or unprocessed gas, as I mentioned. This is the alum fet vet cycle facility where we'll be generating the power. And then these are all the kind of auxiliaries, the uh, various tanks we're going to need to store CO2 and, and oxygen as reserve and also, this a substantial portion of this kit is the air separation unit and this pipe rack here is bringing the oxygen into the facility. But what's more exciting, I think, for, for this whole effort is what the, the bigger picture for Colorado. Um, as I mentioned, there's a fugitive methane capture program uh, that can be further expanded uh, to the west of, of our project that can capture methane that's already naturally leaking to the atmosphere. And because methane per molecule is uh, has a global warming, a greenhouse gas index equivalent to 30 molecules of CO2, uh, we get a significant bump as we capture that methane. It can be fed into the net power system at Coyote Clean Power processed into electricity, zero emissions argon, as well as pure captured CO2. That CO2 is then sequestered or utilized. And ultimately, we've fully taken out uh, significant portions of emissions that would have happened otherwise. Then there's a project, and I heard during my introduction a little bit, um, a mention of Aaron. And so Aaron and the Cross Rivers Group, as well as uh, Savante, Total, Occidental Petroleum, and Lafarge Wholesome are looking at a carbon capture project on a large cement facility uh, in Florence, Colorado. That facility could take some significant amounts of power, I would say, from Coyote Clean Power and further improve the CO2 footprint of that facility enhancing it, its environmental benefits. And so it's quite exciting to think about this CO2 center of gravity that starts to come into play in a region like Colorado, where there's such an expansive plan for intermittent renewables like wind and solar. A baseload facility like this will help reduce power costs uh, for uh, you know, the, the various ratepayers in the region 
and will also provide significant stability to the overall transmission and distribution system. So we're excited uh, to further explore what we've already begun exploring. And in fact, the USEA will be hosting a webinar on June 23rd at 1.30 Eastern uh, that will feature the Southern Ute Indian Tribe, the state of Colorado, Coyote Clean Power, as well as the CEO of Svante to speak about the potential that I'm highlighting here. And so a little bit more about the partners. Um, the Southern Ute um, have been exemplary in their energy leadership, as well as their environmental stewardship leadership. And we are uh, so grateful that we, we've been trusted to partner with them to further develop this project on their sovereign reservation. And Eight Rivers Capital continues to develop projects around the world. Um, and we're making wonderful progress on all of them. And, you know, obviously Idaho and Wyoming are key locations for us that we're considering. Uh, wonderful opportunities from those states to also serve the California market, uh, which more and more needs stable zero emissions base load to pair with its significant renewable rollout. With that, uh, I'm happy to uh, pause and, and take questions. And again, I thank everybody uh, for the opportunity to join. D Damien, how does partnerships with the tribe develop? Uh, how did you get um, to working with um, the Southern New Tribe? And you know, how did this whole um, the, this energy system come about, I guess you could say? Okay, anybody else? Other questions? So uh, I guess I have one for you, Damien. Uh, how is, you know, you talked about a, a couple of the oil and gas operators. Um, how is, you know, the interest from the, the oil and gas industry, you know, for some of the, the, the programming, you know, some of the um, systems that you guys have? Like I'm, I'm from North Dakota, and so we got the Bakken up there. And so um, I'm just interested, how is the industry responding when, when they're in the need of this transition? You know, how, it, what is um, Eight Rivers Capital role in that tra transition? The, the reception I would say from the oil and gas se sector has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, I think they see this as a way to utilize uh, one of the products from their systems, uh, that being natural gas, in a very clean way, while at the same time being able to use a system like this to power refining complexes, uh, integrate with hydrogen production, which we can also do a, a zero emissions blue hydrogen production. Um, and really it's a clean, not only electrical uh, energy source, but thermal energy source as well. And so we're always iterating. Uh, we've got many kind of partnerships in development. Uh, in, in particular in North Dakota, they've been very supportive uh, of our efforts on a solid fuel system. Um, in fact, we're, we've got a $30 million program with the DOE right now uh, to test syngas at our Laporte facility. That syngas would come from things like biomass as, as well as coal around the world because China and India, Australia, and so many places aren't slowing down in their coal consumption and we need a clean solution there. And so 
North Dakota really led the way on that through Elite and Basin Electric. Wonderful partners since 2014 and earlier in supporting our solid fuel work. Further, you know, I have had some discussions with the MHA nation in the region. Mark Fox. And there's certainly, what's that? Yeah, Mark Fox and his team over there. Yeah, yeah. So we've had some, some conversations. And, you know, I think that that group is absolutely wonderful. Key candidate to be working with and they've already got the CO2 capture program off of the North Dakota gasification facility, which delivers clean synthetic natural gas into the pipeline system in that part of the country. And so, yeah, there's really been no limit to the to the level of positive reception we've had. I would say early days, there were a lot of questions around the technology's ability to work in the economics. But more and more, as we're seeing the world adopting carbon pricing in various markets, and we're seeing so many large organizations commit to net zero in some form at some point in time, everybody is really looking for solutions. And this has been able to check a lot of the boxes for a lot of people. So I just got a text from a friend back in North Dakota who's on the live stream. And he's asking, how does this um relate with flared gas you know how, what is your integration there like do you is is that going to affect flaring at all like what you do are you able to you know kind of divert that or is this a, a kind of a separate thing i wouldn't say it's separate so whatever gas is being flared what really matters is this composition um the nice thing about this type of a facility is that it can take, it has more tolerance, I would say, for unprocessed gas than traditional systems. Um, so I think that there, there's certainly an opportunity there. Um, it's certainly much cheaper to run a transmission line than it is a pipeline. So where you do have flared gas, you could pair one of these facilities uh, and produce some electricity. Now, the current size of these facilities is 280 megawatts because we had to pick a size to focus on and and the economic sweet spot, at least for the first of a kind facilities, really sits at the 280 megawatt electric net output. But there is an opportunity to perhaps build smaller units, more modular units into the future. As we see costs come down with learning curves and economies of scale uh, on various components within the system. So I would say, you know, flare gas is something we're certainly aware of, and it's certainly something we've been approached by others about, and we can certainly provide solutions in that area. It's just a matter of bandwidth uh, from our end, as well as focus on resources. So we're not, you know, a Fortune 100 company. We don't have hundreds of staff, uh, and really, so it's just a bandwidth about bringing these first units to market. But certainly, an opportunity if somebody has enough interest to to want to, you know, get us to doing some detailed engineering on that. Well, I, I think I'm going to have to um, reach out to Lieutenant Governor Brand Sanford. He used to be a sponsor of ours uh, back when he did shows there and say, hey, like, what, what can we do to get Eight Rivers going here, to get them churning in North Dakota? Because I know that me personally would like to see a lot of these so solutions deployed, you know, out there. And I think, you know, North Dakota has always been a great prototyping state for, for energy. You know, so I think it's a step ahead of Texas. Um, you know, in Colorado, you're doing great work already there. Um, so let's see, let's see if we can make some things happen. But anybody else have uh, any other questions for, for Damien? Just a quick question. Uh, a lot of excess heat. I noticed that it didn't look like you had a combined cycle unit. Was there a reason for that? Yeah. So the, the, uh, the total system is fundamentally different in natural gas and cycle. Um, a lot of the heat is, in fact, recycled through the system. Uh, the gross turbine efficiency is at 83%. The net electrical efficiency sits at around anywhere from 51 to 60% efficient. And so there's really no place within the cycle to add, say, a steam cycle onto the CO2 turbine because we're utilizing that waste heat coming out of the turbine through heat recuperators as the CO2 cycles back through the system uh, to 
uh, reheat that CO2 as it comes in. So as you can see, you know, this is getting very hot. We're coming out at low at, you know, this exit temperature might be in the order of seven to 800 degrees. And then we're coming through the heat exchanger, ultimately getting down to ambient, but then we're recovering a substantial portion of that heat in this recycling CO2 coming back into the front end. Um, this is a CO2 combustor, and this is a supercritical CO2 turbine as well. So fundamentally different from a natural gas combined cycle. I love what you were saying earlier about, you were like, oh, we should connect you with so-and-so. I think we need to do more of that. I think, you know, we can have all the best ideas in the world or the science or the technology, but we have to share, you know, who is it that we want to talk to and who, who do you know and who do you know? Because, you know, as we combine those resources, you know, we're like one degree away from everyone in the world. So I guess in closing, maybe just real quick, what is a sector you would love to collaborate with or collaborate deeper with? Um, you know, let's just talk about it. Like, man, I would love to talk to this group or this, you know, industry or anything. Yeah, one of the areas that becomes really interesting for a facility like this, and, you know, in North Dakota, we, we do have, again, strong relationships there with the University of North Dakota, ERC, Elite Basin, uh, you know, um, as well as a lot of the, the kind of con federal, congressional, and, and Senate leadership. Um, now, Two of the biggest sectors that I've been looking at and focusing on uh, have been the data center sector, which is a large uh, growth area for electric, electricity consumption. And a lot of the large tech companies have made significant commitments to reducing their CO2 footprint going forward, as well as uh, looking into the past. And so that's one sector where this facility makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other place where we can see near-term decarbonization of fuels is through LNG. So on the liquefaction side, if you electrify the natural gas compression units and refrigeration, you're able to not only uh, provide flexibility in supply in being able to match you know, LNG supply with demand in the market, but you're also able to eliminate the um, emissions footprint with the liquefaction process and loading process. And then if you had a facility like this on the uh, other terminal uh, where you're receiving your, nat your, your LNG, you can then process that LNG into electricity. And there is an iteration of this that we've looked at pretty deeply to produce hydrogen alongside with the electricity. Um, and that can be very attractive, especially if you've got a construct where you've got CO2 sequestration uh, local to or within a reasonable proximity to the uh, LNG receiving terminal. Mm -hmm. And so those are two sectors in particular uh, that, that we find to be uh, very compelling right now. And we've had a lot of uh, both organic as well as facilitated uh, introduction. So are, are you talking, uh, on those two sectors, are you talking to Terrascale yet, uh, Danny and his team over there? Um, in the data centers world, they're out of Nevada, they're low carbon, carbon free um, data centers, Danny Hayes. So that would be one that uh, I could definitely connect you with. How about like, for the midstream guys when you're talking LNG, are you, are you talking, when you're saying LNG, are you talking One Oak, Kinder, uh, Endeavor, you know, guys like that? Is that where you're uh, on the LNG side, I can't get too specific. So yeah, okay, okay. I, what I would say is, if there's a project, if there's an LNG project in the United States or in the world that's being planned right now, we want to bet they've reached out to us. Um, if there's an LNG facility in operation that could have some of its power generation replaced, I'm willing to bet they've reached out to us. But on the data center side, uh, that's just that's one thing that's kind of outside my wheelhouse and okay. any introductions there 
would be more than welcome. All right. There is some interest, I will say, on the Ute Reservation to locate data centers. And this is one of the things that I also talked with the Wyoming Energy Authority about, is the ability to utilize energy resources local to the state rather than export. Use something like CO2 primacy in Wyoming to sequester that CO2 when utilizing those local energy resources. Use the electricity produced to drive data centers and simply export bits instead of MMBTUs. Um, and sequester locally and set up a, a tax incentive for businesses to set up shop in Wyoming and be able to, to monetize those benefits. Nice. I like it. Well, I think, uh, I mean, we have uh, some, some tribal representatives here that will definitely connect you with, you know, especially here for Idaho. Um, even, you know, my father, he's a Turtle Mountain, tri uh, Turtle Mountain Chippewa member. I'm a descendant, technically. Um, but, um, you know, those are some things that we can discuss afterwards. But, you know, I think uh, if anyone has any other questions. And what we'll do, too, is if you're online and you're putting questions in, we'll try to have people circling back. Yeah, and we'll, we'll come through. Yeah, we'll come through and, and follow up as well. And also, you know, be thinking about who you need to get this information out to and tag them, you know, send them this website to get them connected and in this conversation. Because this is just an example of all the people that we know together, all those resources. Then it just, you know, it starts to supercharge all of it. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here on Zoom right, David, today. We're, we're going to catch up with you here in a minute.